My name is uh, Ulysses Baltazar, and we are going to make this very informal. Uh, this is a, uh, you know, wrapping fellowship kind of a situation, right? Uh, who is local? Who, who, we don't have any locals here? You? And, uh, well, thank you for coming all the way to Houston, wherever you're coming from. Um, John Bismuth asked me to give this talk, and uh, I really didn't know how to, st I mean, I gave one last year, but I feel all official now. I have wireless, it's the first time I have wireless stuff, you know, it's incredible. So I'm kind of, so we're going to make it fun, and we are going to make it as fast as possible, because sometimes it gets boring talking about veins, and that's the problem. Nobody cares about veins. And they think, oh, veins, everybody can do it. Uh, oh, is everybody a vascular surgeon here or? Okay, I'm going to say some mean things about other people and I don't want to offend anybody. <laughs> so everybody thinks, you know, yeah, this is easy to do, and veins, anybody can do it, family medicine, my nine-year-old daughter or whatever, you know, everybody. It's not, that, it's not the case. Once you start getting into this, you say, damn, I didn't think about this, or I didn't think this could happen, or this could go this way. So we are going to review this situation a little bit fast. So this is a typical slide that everybody starts, eh, population, blah, blah, to hell with that. That you can read in any book. We are going to do some practical stuff. Yes, I'm going to give you some numbers, but we are going to go over more practical stuff that you might get used uh, um, out of it in your regular practice if you decided to do veins at some point. So you don't have to. You don't have to. You are all fired up about arteries and and understandable, you know, after you spend two years or whatever time you spend, I spent two years of my life, almost 24-7 in the old times, here, when Lumsden, you know Dr. Lumsden? Have you met him? Okay, when Lumsden just got here to, uh, um, uh, to the Methodist Hospital, back there was Baylor. Baylor was uh, joined with Methodist. And uh, you spent two years of your life abandon everything because back then was like that. I think now it's what, 36 hours a week or something where you work or something like that. So, but anyway, but uh, there were weeks that Balkin and I, my other, other fellow, we pulled 110 hours Sunday to Sunday here. I mean, that was brutal, but that was the way it was. So you spent all these years doing vascular surgery. That's my last case and uh, as a fellow. And the notice thing is my index finger. Everybody thinks I might be using a different, different digit. It's not. It's my index finger. I'm done. Lumps in. I'm out of here. And I'm back. Look at that. So careful what you wish for. So you spend all those two years, all these years training in arteries, in all exciting cases, putting, putting the cross clamp in the right, in the uh, beyond the sub left subclavian to do a thoracal abdominal when you have this human being opening half virtually from chest to abdomen and your blood rushes, it's just, and, it's, and then what, right? I mean, okay, yeah, I'm going home, and, 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 and you might sacrifice other stuff that you don't know, and we are going to talk about that in a minute. So why veins? We did one of the first cases uh, of ablation, endovenous ablation in Houston. No, I'm not saying the first, but I do believe it was one of the first cases, at least in Houston, with Lumsden, when the, uh, uh, when the venous closure device came up to the market. This idea came from actually Europe, from in France in 1999, uh, to close the, the, the veins from inside instead of doing the old-fashioned vein stripping, which you know is a good surgery, but we have the downsides. So, you know, I did this, uh, this, these cases with Alan uh, when I was fellow here, and kind of like them, you know, because nobody wanted to do those cases. Every time we had a venous closure in the OR, but, but you understand, Baylor used to have the, one of the largest programs at the time. We were six fellows. Dr. Bismuth, welcome, brother. I'm sorry, the, the, should I wait for you to introduce me and big cheese and everything? Okay, so back then when Bismuth, uh, what year did you start your fellowship? Four, six, yeah. I finished 2003, so back then we had six fellows. This was a large program, two in the first year, two in the second year. So you have the vein cases and nobody wanted to do it. Nobody. I like them. I don't know why, you know. It's like when I was doing my, uh, in, uh, my rotation with interventional radiology and nobody wanted to do the peak lines. 
I love the pick lines. You know why? Because it gave me the touch with the wire. It sounds corny and cheesy or whatever, but I can feel where I am. Because I did two or three a day for, I don't know, six, eight months with George Soltes and all those guys. So, so nobody wanted to do that. But now when I put a wire, I know, I know where I am. And I know if I'm, I shouldn't keep poking or whatever. Or, or it is, it is, it is, that's the part of medicine that is art, the surgery that is art that nobody can describe you. But anyway, bottom line, nobody wanted to do the cases. So I ended up doing most of them. In 2005, for, I came back to Houston and started doing arteries and veins, thinking very naively that I could do that. If you want to have a successful and correct vein practice, if you are thinking, you cannot do arteries. I don't care. I don't give a rat's what people say, okay? You can't. And I had my first swallow in 2007. When I had, I practiced in Sugarland, it's in the southwest area of Houston, a very wealthy area, 98, 99, whatever percent of those people are insured. We don't have any freeloaders there, so you get the picture. So I had a, this good old Texan lady, oil money, old money, coming <clears throat> and telling me that she wanted her veins fixed. And I said, well, the insurance takes about 20, 30 days to, she said, no, 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 I want it next Wednesday because my mom is going to come from Dallas, she's going to help me. With the kids, I want this fixed next ones. You got it? Put the money in the, done, okay. About half an hour before the, the, the appointment, I got a call from the ER. Of course, but of course. We have a cold leg, we need you, you're on call, blah, 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 let's go. So I had to explain to her. And she was very gracious. She said, <laughs> she said yes, doctor, I understand this person is in a life-threatening situation, or like me, but my mom is coming. I arranged my entire life around this. I don't have time for this. I am sorry. Took the money to another practice. You can't do both. I don't care what they say. I do strict. I mean, exclusively veins. Strictly veins, 100%. You can do, cannot do both. If you want to do it right, if you want to be just, go for it. But you cannot do both. Sadly, because I do miss the arterial part. I do miss it. But. You can't have everything on this life. That's the first thing you need to learn. You cannot have your cake and eat it, period. In 2008 was the dropping, <laughs> the drop that spilled the water. Mike Reardon, I don't know, have they met Mike? No. Mike Reardon is one of the most talented cardiothoracic surgeons in the practice here. He was my mentor, part, I mean, uh, uh, along with Lomsen. He just mercilessly cracked my chest and put an AVR on me. And suddenly I was in Fondra and ICU where I put many patients myself. I was now on the other side. And that's what the drop that spilled the water that said, you know, I remember telling my wife, I don't know what I did this. And this hurts like Dickens. It's a warming why. You need to walk your daughters down the aisle. And I said, I don't even see my daughters. That was a personal decision. This is not academics. This is about life, okay? So I don't even I don't see my daughters and, and, and they're gonna be gone. So that's what I said, just veins. So veins is boring. The same thing every day. Same, is, this is not sexist or misogynist. The lady, same thing. I, but I'm going home at five. I can't remember the last time somebody called me at 1 a.m. I cannot. I haven't missed a single activity of my daughters. Uh, one thing that I, I was very grateful last year that my daughter graduated and went to Texas A&M and I said, well, I let her go, but I spent a lot of time with her. So, so those are things that I want to pass you that are not in any books. I'm just telling you why I choose to do this when it's boring, when it's the same thing. It's challenging, but it's not as exciting sometimes as the arterial part. So put forth thought there, guys. So I start learning from... Uh, Two people mainly. John Bergan is one of the, the father of the venous surgery in in, uh, in in the United States. He I don't think he's retired. He's like 102 years now, and uh, he's in La Jolla. And the other one's David Chin, which was a fellow here two years ahead of me that started a very successful practice, and he helped me. And the last thing I how I learned was by the seat of my pants. You know, I just was doing things, reading and doing, and uh, it's going to work. I don't know. So. What I'm going to tell you here, many things are not written in any books. 
are the things that I learned on my own sweat and tears and the patient looked at me like, a, really? This is the crap you did to me? <laughs> you know, the, you need to explain and, and prepare the field in order to have a successful, uh, successful practice. So in 2000, there was a boom of venous treatment. Everybody wanted to do veins, everybody. Cardiologists, primary care doctors, interventional radiologists, vascular surgeons, everybody wanted to do veins. Why? Well, because Medicare used to pay $1,700 per vein. And some insurances that I had contracts with, like PHCP, PHCP, five grand for one vein. That means if you're gonna treat superficial veins, the greater saphenous vein and the lesser saphenous vein, if you do one at a time, one at a time, back to back, you're gonna get, if you did do the four days in the four veins in four days, you're gonna get twenty thousand dollars. Who doesn't want to jump in that boat? Come on, let's do it, right? So everybody start jumping into that, of course. Yeah. So in no global fields, that means that you, you know, when you do your surgery, your triple A. It's 90 days, you cannot charge the patient unless there's a complication, there is some loopholes that you can jump, you know, little modifiers in your CPT codes or uh, that you can get paid. But 90 days is included in the $3 they gave you for the fem distal bypass. So no global fees, let's do it, right? Okay, well, in 2005, this schedule came down and even more obvious. Okay, they reviewed it, revised it and, and, and brought down $1,300. Look at what it, coronary quintuple bypass get, gets reimbursed for. Why the cardiothoracic surgeons are doing veins? Well, because this takes 15 minutes in your office. And no, there is no hassle of, you know, post-op care, ICU, calls, nothing. So that's why this has been exploited the way it has been, because it has been abused. And that's why Medicare and all this stuff is coming down and controlling and regulating every step of vein care with reason for people that have abused this. Of course, it's affecting people that we try to have an honest practice and, 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 and tell the truth to the patients and how to proceed with the treatment. So you have, a, this, let's say that you decided to see some vein patients, I don't think, I, I, my guess is nobody wants to do veins here 100%, and it's understandable. I just told you, you spent two years training in arterial stuff, throwing stitches on that carotid and, and, and femoral, and you want to feel the rush of doing that, and that's understandable. But if you want to do some veins, so, you know, you have symptomatic, the, the patients can be divided in two groups, you know, grossly, roughly. The symptomatic patients, and then, you are going to classify those patients, and we're going to talk about that in a minute with the C, uh, the, the C classification and the uh, venous uh, uh, clinical severity score. You are going to classify those patients and see where you are. Normally, they are going to come to you. If they are not sent by somebody, they are going to come to you self-refer because leg pain. And that's one of the things. Leg pain is veins. They see one little reticular vein. Oh, that's because of my vein pain. And of course, the patient is like 350 pounds, and they don't know why the leg hurts, right? Anyway, so you need to be tactful, how to say that. I mean, very gentle, how to explain that, you know. But you can have peripheral arterial disease. You can have a spinal stenosis. Patient tells you, I stand in line buying the tickets to go into the movies, and 10 minutes later, I cannot tolerate my legs. I need to move them. That can be spinal stenosis. Performance syndrome is another, another entity that can cause pain, numbness in the buttocks that runs down to the back of the leg. They don't know what it is. Degenerative joint disease of the of the of the back, of the, you know, the lumbar and, and 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 sacrum that can also compress nerves and give you symptoms. You can have leg edema, or you have the asymptomatic patient that wants to come here, and with reticular veins, you know, the spider veins. And I love this phrase. Everybody uses that. They're unsightly. Okay. Well, don't look at them. But you are here. Let's go ahead and uh, let's go ahead and help you. That's what I think. I don't tell them that. They won't come back. They won't send the sister on their mother or whatever, you know. And they are going to come and see Peden, and Peden will send them to Richard Lee, and they are going to run all over the place. So, so uh, classify your patients. You need to have a baseline, you know. When you have a, uh, when you have a patient with a claudication, you are going to do uh, venous ultrasound with AVIs, and then you do your venogram, blah, blah, blah. You do all that stuff, but how are you going to follow the, 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 the fem distal bypass? 
ABIs. It's the simplest way, you know, to see how it's progressing. So you need to have a baseline before the, the, the FEM distal well. You need to have a baseline before you treat the vein. So the two things that I use to classify my patients, to put, in, put them in a place, are the classification CEIP and the revised ven venous clinical severity score. The, the, the first letter of the CEIP is a clinical part. And this, if you don't remember anything, remember this because it's coming in your boards, okay? So the C0 is asymptomatic. Those legs that you wish you had, maybe you, one of you have, I don't know, but some legs that you see on, 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 on the beach and say, man, those are Z. Next time you're gonna be, in the, you're gonna be like a C1, C3, you're gonna be like that, or at church. I'm like that and my wife says, why are you looking at this? I think I know those legs. I mean, seriously, <laughs> you know? I think I've seen those before, that, those, that, those veins. Anyway, okay, excuse to see legs, but anyway, it's not good. So, C1, telangiectasias, the, 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 the spider veins. And those have other classifications. We are going to see that in a minute. So those are the spider veins, you know. C3, I mean, C2, varicose veins, the real ropey varicose veins, more than six, four, six millimeters in diameter and up, those are varicose veins. C3, edema, swelling. C4 has its sub-classification, A and B. The eczema, you know, the skin start having some reaction locally due to the pressure uh, from the edema and all the transudate and the lymphatic fluid can irritate, create some reaction locally and looks like a eczema there. And uh, 4B, lipodermatosclerosis. This is a very, very tricky disease. Poorly understood, poorly explained, and because we don't understand what it is, guess what? We can do crap about it. So the patients come with this, and this is the thing, with lipodermatosclerosis, I wanna take a minute here because it's important. Has different stages. Sometimes it's painful, like they are burning with a torch, and they cannot tolerate anything, it's real. Because you're gonna, it's like when you have mesenteric ischemia, they have the abdominal pain out of proportion in the abdomen, and you touch them, and it's soft, and they are like, well, same here. You're gonna see, is it, that is hurting that much? They are in tears and sometimes it doesn't hurt anything. It's very unpredictable, ups and downs, lipodermatosclerosis. And there is a series of steps that the common sense and the books recommend to take care of this. And, you know, is if they, are, they have venous insufficiency, correct the venous insufficiency, diabetes, correct diabetes, uh, weight loss control, and some other medications can be used, you know, like a pentoxifilin to increase the blood flow, but really nothing has taking care, takes care of this. And that's a sad situation because they see this deformity and they want to, how can I, it's irreversible. It's not gonna go away, lady. I'm so sorry, or gentleman, et cetera. It's not gonna go away. The objective is to try to halt it so it doesn't go, doesn't go. Something that I do empirically, when you have a patient like this that come to you that is very painful and you already did your workup, there is no other problems locally obvious, you know, that are causing that, I give a one week course of, a, of a, a medrol dose pack, steroids, to bring the inflammation down quickly. It's empiric, it's not science, this is not written anywhere, okay? I'm mean, talking about desperate times required desperate measures, okay? So I get, and most of the patients get some improvement. So, sorry, some of the patients get some improvement. The majority of the patients get relief. It's not permanent and you need to tell them that because he's gonna come back. This is just, the steroids are like, you know, the shotgun of the medicine, you know, give it, see what happens, and, and maybe, maybe improves, but it has worked for me. C5, ulcerative, uh, I mean, ulcer, active ulcer, so that's clear, isn't, and C6, uh, by the way, the same patient after we took care of her, is ulcer healed, so those are the, the, the C classification of the CIP uh, classification. That's the C part, the clinical part. And that's a very useful tool to classify your patients before you start, before you start taking care of that. Because if you don't have that baseline, it's not going to work. Yeah. yeah. Because one of the things we see a lot and, and oftentimes uh, is a little bit difficult to deal with is the mixed arterial venous disease patients. Mm -hmm. And those obviously don't always fit in, in the classification of, you know, kind of like, they're mid, mid, mid of the road both in both directions, which one do you treat first and which one? And I, I think that stuff is even, even still now for me, I think kind of ch a challenge. It is, it is. And uh, uh, you know, I have a little, a little um, 
slide ahead that might help you clear that. When we get to that, if that's not it, I'll, 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 I'll address it. But it is, it is. The Crabismal raises a very good question, a very good point. You have the mixed patients. What do you do? We're going to see that in a minute. So <clears throat> in 2000, the American Venus Forum established the Venus Severity Score System to classify your patients and see what will, you know, what could give you a better way to classify and understand this kind of stuff. No, we aren't going to go through it, but the, uh, the Venus Severity Score system is, is, is formed by three different other systems. They took pieces, bits and pieces here and there, and they, make, they made one, and including the clinical part of the uh, CAP system. In 2008, it was a revised Venus Clinical Severity Score that will involve all these points to give a very accurate classification to the patient, and you can catalog that patient more precisely in, in certain level that is going to give you a baseline in how to uh, continue the treatment. The revisions were expanded pain description. Not, not only the pain is a burning, it's a, it's a throbbing. It's, it's, it's what is intensity? It's, it's all day long. It's, it's just in, in the morning and all that stuff. The size of the veins. The edema is not the same, just ankle edema at 6 o'clock after standing all day long, that edema above the knee just at noon. You know, obviously the reflux is more intense or the, the, the problem is, is bigger and so forth. So I use the two to classify my patients in my first encounter. So that's, you need to have a tool, and I'm not advocating this to, there are the most, this, I'm a dyslexic guy, so it's simple for me. Pom, 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 pom. One, two, three, four. When you start putting me all, no, I, I, wait a second. No, I need to do this. So this tool help, worked for me tremendously to classify and follow the patients. Take pictures. That's key. <laughs> I found that that's key, at least in my practice. Not only I can show you guys, but because you as a surgeon, you are very hard on you. That's how we are. That's who we are. And the patients are going to come. You're going to see them every day. You're going to see them every whatever. And then they come back, and, they are, and you still see some veins. And you say, damn it, we haven't done anything, right? Or the patient come, still here, right? You take the picture, and you will be surprised. Trust me, you will be surprised. You don't remember. You, you, you think you still you want perfection. As a surgeon, you want perfection. So you don't, you don't have that leg nice and smooth. It's not perfect, but nevertheless, 60, 70 percent better, and you will start learning how to see that. So pictures are key, I beg you. And the patients, when they come back and they say, "This hasn't changed," uh, let me take a picture of me, so and so. Look at that. Oh my goodness. <laughs> they have pictures. Though. Sometimes they have pictures, you but but iPhone but just put it in your right no no no. I have a I have a camera. I have a camera. Yeah yeah. No iPhone. Come on, Peter. <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> Hey, man, come on. So you need to have a vascular laboratory that is trustful and reliable. So I'm going to give you a few words about this, the, the, the study, the, what you need to look for. The reflex study is done standing, not in bed, no 45 degrees. Nobody does it. Why? Because it's, 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 it's uncomfortable. This is a mess, standing the patient. So, so you need to do it standing, OK? Uh, because it's how the venous insufficiency comes to be. It's not when you are dying down. As a matter of fact, one key question for a patient that you are doubting that the symptoms are coming from veins, you ask her in the morning, your legs feel good or you still hurt in the morning? If the legs feel good in the morning, most likely it's going to be your veins. If the legs hurt in the morning, you know, ma'am, I don't think it's your veins. Unless it has something really advanced, but you, that will jump to you, you know, like a central venous occlusion that is permanently blocking the, 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 uh, re the venous return, yeah, in the morning they are going to be symptomatic, but that is not just regular veins. So it needs to be done standing. You need to have the diameter of the greater saphenous vein, the lesser saphenous vein, and perforator veins. The depth from the skin, because when you are going to do an ablation, you need to have at least a centimeter for many reasons. Some people, some people say, no, 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 it's not true. I can, I can inject the tumescent anesthetic. OK, let me stop here. How many people have done a venous ablation here? Everybody? Good, excellent. So they say, I'm going to inject 
the tumescent solution to give a space between the skin and the, and the vein, right? And then you have the centimeter. It's true. And you very smart with the wire or whatever, do, you ab you do your ablation, and yeah, you don't burn the, the skin, but guess what? That vein is going to come to the surface when the, when, the, uh, when the tumescent is gone, and the vein is full of clot. And that is going to stain the skin, and then three weeks later, a month later, the patient is going to come with this brown streak where the great esophagus vein was, just because you wanted to do $1,300. I mean, to make $1,300. You're going to see some cases. I'm, I'm not here to show you all the perfect pictures. What? They're in every book. They're in every conference. And by now, you are learning that I don't beat that, that, that. I don't drum to that beat. I, I do my own thing. So I'm going to show you big messes here. So you avoid them. My chairman in general surgery used to say the good, the, the, a good surgeon learns from his mistakes. A great surgeon may, learns from somebody else's mistakes. So I, I hope this will give you some, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, some idea of this. So reflux long, longer than 500 milliseconds in the superficial system, because in the deep system is being advocated is one second, not 500 milliseconds, not half a second. So that's important to know. Deep proximal from the popliteal up, the posterior tibials and the peroneal is still 500 milliseconds, but deep proximal, one second. The diameter of the vein, that's important, you know. In greater lasophenous vein, less than 5.5 millimeters, the sensitivity for negative for reflux was 78 and specificity 87. Nevertheless, nevertheless in the 7.3 in the 7 or larger, the predicted reflux was also high, 80 and 85%. So if you have your ultrasound coming back and tells you this greater saphenous vein is normal, and the diameter is 7.5 millimeters, we scan that patient. Probably wasn't done correctly. Probably was at the end of the day. Probably was in supine position, not standing. So it's important to, do, to, to know these numbers. And this is the key. When you treat a greater saphenous vein less than 5.5 millimeters, or 5.5 millimeters, there is no much clinical improvement on that patient afterwards. I'm telling you. Because the fact that you have a three or four millimeter vein and you're going to burn it because you need to pay your daughter's tuition is not the right thing to do because it's not going to change anything or minimum in the patient's symptoms, none. And you're going to take some chance away from that particular patient to have use that vein as a conduit and the conduit for a future procedure. And it's not, it's, it's, it's not right. So you need to see your patient globally, not just veins. That's what happens when other specialties start doing this, because they have no idea the problem that is for Dr. Peden to get a bypass fem distal when the guy doesn't have a vein. You know, of course now with all the assets we have, there is all the resources. Of course, I'm not saying it's a lost case, but that's the easiest way. So, less than 5.5 millimeters, unless they have a clear problem that there is an ulceration, which it's not going to be with that diameter, but there is something clear, then you might consider doing it. But I, I, I will not do it. Small and leading right in the varicose veins. That's what I'm saying. When you have a clear problem, you have a clear problem, you can do that. But the other thing is that vein, if you, if you ablate that vein, yes, absolutely. You can, you can have it at that, that, that those varicose veins um, control or improve and all that kind of stuff. But if it's a 65-year-old woman, diabetic, are you going to take that vein out? Hell no. Just do a phlebectomy. There. Try to save that vein for Michael Reardon or Ramshandani or somebody that do, do my, my needs later. I don't know. I mean, try to see the patient in, in, uh, in, in, in a comprehensive way. And most importantly, like is your mom, your wife, your sister, or your daughter. That's how you need to see the patient. <clears throat> so this is the, the what I was telling you. Oh, bismuth. Okay. So you have a patient. This is the little algorithm that I have. Okay, it's not perfect. It's mine again. C1, normal patient, but has some reticular veins. You see, uh, it's reticular veins. You do a quick ultrasound. You sweep that ultrasound up and down 
to see the diameter of the greater saphenous vein, do a quick reflux at the junction, make sure that the vein is not six, and six millimeters or something like that, and it's normal, so you do a quick ultrasound. So you can do, if it's normal, you can do laser to get those veins, you know, transcutaneous laser, or you can do sclerotherapy. Regardless, regardless, after you are done, see these compressions, it don't matter. Don't let the patient come and tell you that, I saw in Dr. Oz that once you do this, you don't need compression stockings. You always need compression stockings, always, okay? No, but you have another patient, C2, C3, you know, and I'm talking about the not obvious. As you see, we are not talking about the lipodermatosclerosis, the ulcers. I'm talking about the one that had edema and varicose veins, what to do. So you are not sure, or if you think it's venous, if you are not sure, you try compression. That's a great test. And no, people say, ah, that's a great test. You order compression stockings, wear them for one, two weeks, and tell me how you felt. If, oh, I mean, you can do compression or you can do directly sent to the venous uh, reflux ultrasound. Of course, cost effectiveness, you know? I mean, I'm gonna spend 300, 400, or whatever cost the venous ultrasound in the hospital for the patient versus order the compression. So, patient doesn't have money. The patient is self-paid. Let's try the compression first, first and see how you do it. And then if the compression doesn't change anything, the symptoms are the same, you need to reassess that patient. That means, that means that it's not venous. That means that it's PAD, spinal stenosis, piriformis syndrome, something else, okay? Yeah. And they don't realize they just stepped in the bear trap, that that was the wrong answer. If you've got venous yeah. disease and elevation yeah. and compression don't help, yeah. you ought to run away because you're not going to satisfy that person. Absolutely. Absolutely. That, that's, that, that's true. We'll get there in a minute, but that's true. So if they don't help, you need to reassess that patient and see what might be the alternative. Uh, if the compressions, if, if they help, well, do the reverse ultrasound because you're going to find something. Where? I don't know. It might not be superficial veins. It might be deep veins, and then guess what? You go back to compressions because I'm not going to advise you under any circumstance to mess with the deep system for this kind of problem. If the reflux ultrasound is negative, reassess, do reassessment again and try to find the cause of the pain or try to guide the patient where to go. But if it's positive, proceed with the treatment. But guess what? You are going to get back to compressions. So this is, this is my algorithm. It's what I do in my practice, okay? Um, but this is, the, this is, the, this is the, the problem because we are in Houston. I don't know where you guys are going to be practicing. If you are practicing in Alaska, that's cool, but it's not going to work here. So, and I always advocate that the people, that the book says that you need to wear compression stockings every day, eight to 10 hours minimum, right? But I always advocate that people that write the books are people just sitting behind desks or having residents working. I'm sorry. Peden, Lomsen, I told you, I don't, I'm not politically correct. I'll tell you the way it is, I don't give a rats. So, so you know, they're not gonna use it. The other thing is, patients need, the, the patient need uh, uh, 20 to 30 millimeters of mercury and he's 70 year old with arthritis. Seriously? Seriously? Do you think that woman is gonna put that compression stocking? Wake up, people. He's not. So what are you doing? Just curing yourself and making the spenders $100, $110. So this is what I do. I tell my patients, I know you need 15 to 20. I mean, 20 to 30. I'm going to give you 15 to 20. I know it's not the proper compression, but at least you're going to get some benefit out of it. Second thing, in the summertime or when it's hot, you don't have to wear them every day. You should, but I wouldn't do it myself. So try to wear it as much as possible. If that is once a week, so be it, it's better than nothing for six months. Okay, once a week. Elevate your legs, lose some weight, exercise, all that kind of stuff. That's the key, because if you go rigid by the book, guess what? Nobody's gonna get the benefit of it. So you need to be, you need to be flexible in that, and that's what I learned in my practice after 10 years of doing this, you know, to, all the time. Concept that 20 
30 millimeter stockings that are sitting in a drawer are not as effective as 15 millimeter stockings that are on your leg. Of course. And I often tell people, go to the medical supply place and get a pair of stockings that oh, you have to get on. That's so many of these what? people have arthritis and they can't pull them up and they don't use them. And it's, it's just silly. Last year I took 40 minutes and nobody said anything. Well, I guess I'm late because they changed the, I don't, I don't follow scores and calendars and last year it took me 40 minutes and nobody said anything. Peden is already moved, so let's move on. So you can have veins like this. I want to go fast. There is not much left, but anyway. So you can have this. Notice. This is all That last picture was Quebec No, no, no. Last picture, no. Last picture. Both lesser side, oh, this one, one. mm-hmm. No, this is because <laughs> this is the key, dude. <laughs> okay, this, this guy, Asian guy, was a manager in one of the fast food restaurants. Lesser side of vein ablation. That's it, I didn't do anything. So, patience is another thing. This is not magic. Whatever Dr. Oz says on TV is paid by that evil demon opera. So don't, 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 <laughs> don't, don't do that, okay? Now this, ablation only. this not. Uh, what I mean ablation only do? Uh, the other one, yeah. This, I know, come on, Peter, get up. So this, this are, are ablation and phlebectomies, okay? The vein didn't recoil, they didn't, didn't recoil like in the other gentleman, so I needed to do phlebectomies. And this is about, you know, four, six weeks afterwards. So, so you do ablation only and then just do stab and let remain? Yeah. I start that way unless they don't want to wait. Doctor, I really don't want to keep coming. Okay, you want to do the ablation and then the phlebectomy at the same, same time. Or, very commonly after Obamacare, they are losing the insurance. So we don't have time to wait to do to see the progress of this so no. yes well <laughs> <laughs> all right very definitive john very definitive it's hard to give a hard rule yeah. a lot of it, it is kind of it's individual it's what they're you know do they have a job or they do they are they going to take a little time off do they want to get it done at once i don't typically do two legs ever at once that's yeah. just me i do one leg at a time and let them sort of recover from that especially if you do it a professional part of that's your calendar all, all right all right well let's Let's keep going because I, you know, I have time. What time this needs to be finished? This is over this lecture. What time is the lecture over at mine? No, Peden is has itching. What? There you go, Peden. How do you like it, man? How do you like it? How do you like it? How do you like me now? So, all right. Pay attention. Pay attention. See what you see on this video if it plays. See what you see. It's supine. It's a venogram, of course. What do you see? Somebody. What do you see? Oh, hey, Peden, you, yeah, it's supine. supine. It's supine. It's not prone. It's supine. You don't, you don't say anything, Peden, please. Come on, somebody leave. Come on, guys. You are, you're going to be dealing with that in two months. And there is nobody in front of you that is going to tell you blah, 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 blah. You got to say this. What is it? Is, that's what you see. Pay attention. It's supine. It's not, it's, not a, it's not an angiogram, it's a venogram. What is the cava? It's a partial duplication of vena cava, okay? So this patient, as I saw in the previous slide, obese, diabetic lady with some atrial fibrillation, she went on for cardiac ablation. Went through the right, the cardiologist, I saw the wire going a little bit way, a little weird way, but I got to the heart <laughs> and I just did the ablation. Okay. So he sent it to me three months later because the leg was awful and she never had that problem before. What happened? She got a DVT on the right leg because she has what we know as a reverse May Turner syndrome. You know what that is? The May Turner syndrome, what is it? What is it? The what? Say it again. Correct. So normally, this is in the other way. So the, the right common iliac artery comes here, and the left common iliac vein comes here, and the artery compresses. So that is a May Turner. This is the other way, because this has 
this partial duplication of in a cave. So I did the, I, I got a CAT scan and boom. And they sent it to another cardiac surgeon and he said, I'm not gonna put a filter. This is too weird. <laughs> okay. All right. All right. So anyway, I was able to help this lady identify this and balloon it. I did put a filter. It's in the other side, so I warn everybody before every radiologist just flips that I the filter is in the aorta or God knows, you know. And we got a good result. Those are the trick veins that can get you, you know, and you're thinking, oh, it's just a DVT, you know, I just, uh, no, no, be more aggressive. And one thing I didn't do on this patient that I regret is the intravenous ultrasound. I didn't, that would be awesome. But anyway, so summary, listen to the patient. We are not done, <laughs> not yet. Listen to the patient. They will tell you, my dad is a, is a general surgeon in Mexico, and he told me, listen to the patient. They will give you the diagnosis, but nobody listens. Everybody talks over the patient. Listen to the patient. He will tell you what he has the great majority of the time, and it's true. Just listen to the patient. Clarify the patient's expectations. Be watchful when the patient said, I want these veins gone. I want to disappear. I don't want it anymore. Uh-uh. It's not, it's not that way, princess. It's not going to happen <laughs> that way. Okay? Neither is going to be fully gone. Neither is not going to come back. They will come back. So, and then the other thing is, I mean, what is the area that you don't like, ma'am? I, I can't do the entire leg. Might as well give an IV infusion. You know, I'm not going to do that. So, we need to choose areas. If the lady wants to wear shorts, concentrate on that. Don't offer any more than they are asking because you get in trouble and you will see. I'm sorry, oh, dang it, sorry. Uh, comprehensive assessment, we'll talk about it. <clears throat> Determine the origin of the symptoms, if it's arterial, if it's venous, if it's neurological. Compression trial, don't forget the pictures. I, I, that has saved my rear end more than once, okay? Not because a vein is incompetent needs to be treated. See the patient as a whole. If the patient has unstable angina and the vein is 5.5 millimeters, for Christ's sake, save it. You don't know if Mike is gonna use it, okay? Uh, have a good referral network with your primary care doctors. Solid vascular lab, and this is key. Always scan your patients. I'm not saying don't send them to the vascular lab. I'm saying when you are gonna do the case, put the freaking ultrasound. Because the vascular lab is going to tell you the greater saphenous vein is incompetent. And no, it might be the anteromedial branch. They are not as detailed as you are because you are the one are going to put the wire there. Or they are going to tell you the, the greater saphenous vein is seven millimeters, clearly incompetent, and blah, blah, blah. But it's all like this. How are you going to pass that wire there? You won't. And then you are going to look like fool right there. in the, with the that, that doesn't work. And the last thing is the saphenofemoral junction. They are not going to tell you. Now they are requesting the diameter of the saphenofemoral junction. When you do the ablation, you know that you leave about 1.5 to 3 centimeters of neck in the saphenofemoral junction to prevent any thrombus or injury of the common femoral vein. You ablate from there down, right? There's a cul-de-sac that in everybody, in every patient is going to form a clot, everybody. But the tributaries of the greater saphenous vein are going to keep the flow in theory and prevent from that clot to progress. If the clot is formed and the tributaries don't and are not enough to control that, that clot is going to grow. And you're going to be depending on the saphenofemoral junction. If that neck is small, nothing is going to happen. But this big, that can go. And the last thing you want is a call on Saturday when you are free because you are doing veins from the ER that your patient can breathe and has a pulmonary embolism. Saphenofemoral junction, don't forget about that. Always scan your patients. Know the anatomy, what you're gonna be doing. All right, sclerotherapy, this is the last part real quick. Three things I tell my patients, not overnight, not 100%, not forever. Sorry, ladies, okay? That's what I tell them. Not overnight, the veins are gonna look worse before they look better, and takes, I tell them, takes up to three months to start healing. Months, no weeks. So and they don't want to come back two weeks. Still here. <laughs> you didn't hear what I told you? Three months to get better. So pay attention to that. Not 100%. It's not going to be white clean. 
It's going to have some leftovers there, and they will come back. You need to tell them that because this is cash. Insurance companies don't pay for this. Insurance companies pay for sclerotherapy for large veins, for varicose veins. And you can get away, put them in insurance, and inject the, the reticular veins and blah, blah, blah. But if they come and audit you, all that money needs to go back because you didn't inject varicose veins, more than six millimeters. So when the patient tells you, but my insurance says they pay for it, that's why. They pay for the varicose vein, not for the spider vein. So this is cash. And it can amount to a lot of money. And they are going to pay for that thinking that it's never going to come back, that they are cured. And it's not the truth. That, that expectation thing is a huge difference. You know, the expectation when insurance is paying, and if it doesn't look perfect, it's a big deal. They had a little out of pocket. It's not too bad. The safety insurance covers it. When they pay cash, they put 450 down. They're a lot more pissed off, and their expectations yep. are much higher. Yeah. And it's, now you're talking about a real cosmetic practice, like doing a blue job that doesn't look right. Now you've got problems, or a facelift that's cocked up. If you want to save headaches, don't do sclerotherapy. Because that's where all your, most of your headaches will be in that cash group. Absolutely. You know? Absolutely. Expectations. Be clear with your patient. And I'm telling you this. When I started the vein practice, I was halfway saying things because I didn't want to lose the patient because I needed to build the practice. I started in Sugarland from zero, literally from zero. Thanks to David Shin that helped me, I built the practice that now is busy. Zero. I do. I, I do. I do. I do have some, some uh, uh, brochures that I created, and I give them that, the you know, instructions, what to expect, and everything. And the other thing is, tell the patients, tell the patients, because now the internet is everywhere, right? You need to tell them, you want to you wanna research this? Go ahead, but don't go to any bogus, crappy website, you know, like uh, Wikipedia. And, and No. Go to reputable places, Society of Vascular Surgery, uh, Mayo Clinic, Cliff. And, and any, any like that, any places reputable like that, send them, okay? Send them. Uh, but clarify that don't look into places that they are no, have no reputation, you know? I tell you, a handout is very useful. It's sort of it's your doctor yeah. says, this is what makes it, this is how this works, here's what we do, here's what we're taking. I used to have them sign that as a consent form. It was about 20 pages because you've read this. And it was amazingly helpful because it was exactly as you said. Somebody yeah. comes back later and says, oh, Right here on page seven, you know, you know, I did read that. Uh, there you go. And it's a very effective sort of de-escalating yeah. of, of that sort of, oh, I didn't know. Yeah, you did. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, this would be, yeah, well, it's safe. Oh, shit. Yeah, you have I mean, to. I this am. is a very highly litigious stuff. Yeah, it is. And you describe, it, well, it's not small print, but, you know, you'd say this is what America's name is. You show the reflux. You show the various <laughs> Yeah. Pulmonary embolism. Stroke. You know, it's stroke. It's good to have that stuff written down so that you're not sitting there on the back end going, hey, you're going to be suitable, baby. Everything's fine. <laughs> and then they come back with a damn leg that's swollen with PE or something else. It's, I mean, it's, you know, you're basically doing unnecessary stuff. So you want to be protected on that. To me, and, you know, on the back side, it's because some of these people will have a bad outcome. You know? it, is, it is important to clarify all that. Is There's no question about that. You know what I'm going to do? Because my wife says, what are you doing? I want to take a selfie with all of you guys. Go ahead and smile if, we, if you can. <laughs> there you go. So <laughs> classification real quick. The Telangiectasias. This is the little splitting hairs, OK, just for whatever. Less than one millimeter. This is the typical vein that created the spider vein name, OK? Venulectaceous, one to two millimeters. Same thing, but anyway, you know, just people that, all those guys that I'm telling you that are behind the desk writing books, I need to put my name on this. They, I'm, a, I'm amazed the reticular veins, two to four millimeters, having had a personal name, uh, the Peden vein, or I don't know, something like that. But anyway, so there it goes. So what do you have to inject? We have several categories, which is confusing to me, and I'll tell you in a minute why. Detergents. Detergents are caustics, right? Irritate. So sodium tetracyl sulfate. So tridecol, polydocanol, and sodium moruate are the main use in the United States. They are the, FD, the three FDA-approved substances. Doesn't mean they are the best. It's whoever has paid the FDA correctly, okay? 
The other one, I don't even know it. I just put it there for completeness. Osmotic, hypertonic sodium chloride. This is FDA approved, not for sclerotherapy, for other medical situations, but not sclerotherapy. But it's use of label. It's for tradition, it's been used for a long time. And sclerodex, that is a combination of uh, saline and glucose and has some alcohol also. I, I, I have no experience with that. And the last classification is chemical irritants. So what were the other ones? Or, 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 see, they need to divide. They need to put the classification on so and so, BS, you know. So this glycerin is excellent, but it's not available in the United States. This is Canada and Argentina have it. It's a little bit painful, but the great thing is the staining is almost none with glycerin. So that's, that's just for you, food for thought for you guys to learn. The FDA, what I told you, those three, yes, sir. Do you inject many people that are black or Indian or? I do. Do you have more problems with staining or hyperpigmentation? It's, I think it's the same, but it's not as visible as a nice white skin, right? It's all brown there. So you, you do have, you get trouble with them? I was just kind of worried about having pigment issues. And well, the there are two things. But 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 do you do you drain them? No. No, because you are busy doing the and that's fine. That's what I'm saying. You are busy doing the carotid arterectomy, the fem distal bypass that I send you, the rescuing my ass of patients that get there. I, you you need to drain those veins. You need to drain them. So and that's tedious. That's boring. But you need to drain the veins after you inject them. That way the blood doesn't sit there and the hemosiderin doesn't goes to the skin and stain the skin as bad. It's tedious, it's annoying. What do you mean by I'm going to admit it. It's tedious, annoying, painful to the patient, but that decreases that. That's what a 100% vein practice is. So the sodium overweight is, is approved for esophageal hepatitis, 5%. Sodium tetracyl sulfate is the, what I use. For telangiectasias, the concentration comes in one and three percent presentation. You need the max is not written everywhere, but they say 10 to 12 cc's per day is what they, in the conferences, they say the big kahunas of veins. Uh, tel telangiectasias, these are the doses, these are the dilution you need to make to inject the, those veins, uh, that concentration. <coughs> Polydocanol came to the States in the past three, four years and, and, and claiming that the staining is less, and those are the injections. I don't use it, I use just sodium the trisim sulfate, and I'm gonna start using glycerin as long as methodists give me some leash because they got me like this. Uh, but I, I'm l working with that. And for the hypertonic saline that is off-label, these are the concentrations. The problem with this is very effective, but the problem is very painful. Very painful, number one. And number two, if extravasates has a high concentration, I mean, uh, chances of ulceration of the skin, okay? Because it's very, very uh, damaging. But you know, is one of the best uh, substances when done correctly. The testari technique is how to make foam. I don't know if you are familiar with that. You know, you mix with a three-way stopcock, three or four centimeters of air, filter air with this technique, the fiber vein, that is a two micron filter, and that way the air is sterile. And you make your foam, there is certain conditions, it needs to be done 20 times, the foam needs to be used within 60 seconds, no after that and so forth. So this is another, another way to enhance the sclerosis because when you have air bubbles, obviously, it's going to diffuse less through the, flu through the intravascular space. It's going to stick the, to the endothelial wall and create the, natura the naturation of the proteins and, and the closure. So, so that's the desired technique. We're almost done. I ask the patients three things. Are you allergic to sulfur or sulfur like it is, right? Yeah. I'm allergic to sulfur, OK? So heart murmurs or migraines. Why? Because those two medications, so, so Tradicol and Sclera are sulfur based So you cannot use in sulfur allergy patients. Heart murmurs. Why? Because paradoxic <laughs> embolization, you know what is that, right? Okay. So what is it? What is paradoxic embolization? Somebody? The what? So keep going. That's, that's paradoxic embolization. So 
I mean, it's one in a million, but we know that very asymptomatic PFOs are very common. So you need to have at least cover. I'm not saying you're going to do an echocardiogram, a cardiac cat, or whatever to see if there is a connection before, before sclerotherapy, but at least question, listen to the patient's heart, make sure there is no murmur there. You know, that might raise a suspicion, <coughs> okay? Heart murmurs for that and migraines because this medication can trigger migraines, episodes of migraines on people that have migraines. So you need to tell the patient, if you have migraines, how bad are they? If they are disabling, might not be a candidate for this. If they are not disabling, you advise to take the medication or bring it with her in case the migraine starts because it's quite rapidly. Uh, risks, you need to tell them with all the words and openly the failure that might not do anything, worsening, matting. Matting, I'll show you a picture right now in, in a little bit. Uh, staining, what we're talking about, that the vein is gone, but the hemosiderin stays and you see the vein streak. Ulceration, allergic reaction, and of course the stroke because of paradoxic embolization. You need to explain this to them so they know what they're getting into because everything is so easy on TV, in all the, the commercials and everything, that just do it, right? So it's not the case. So. Vein disease, 42% is genetic. So when they say, what is this? Why do you mean it's going to come back? Because most likely you have, and you ask, you have mom and dad or anybody, uh, other family members with vein disease. 42% is, is genetic. The other three are lifestyle. You know, I mean, lifestyle is, is obesity, pregnancy is more than three, and lifestyle, people that stand all the time. So this is very useful to know because you can tell them with n facts, with numbers. That's why this is non-curable. That's why this is going to come back. This can be fight. So you need to get used to, you know, compression stockings, exercise, try to control your weight and so forth because this is unstoppable. Okay? Uh, and not two things. There is a God and it's not me. And you need to tell them that because they want, I want everything gone. Just born again, lady, but I, I'm not, I can't do that, you know? So... So you need to be clear. This is sclerotherapy uh, with the foam I was doing with. I don't do foam anymore. I don't. I just do liquid. I try to get the trunk. This is what I can, I can teach you. This takes years and years and years of knowing the angle and the feel in the needle because it's a 30-gauge needle. That, I'm going to fail. I went too deep. I, you can see how I, I retract. I, so I need to look for another trunk. I try to look a big trunk. You know, like this one. So I can teach you that. This is something that you guys are going to have to experience on your own. The, the feel of the needle and the angle is it, not in any book. So you need to do that, okay? So, so that's the part of the art that this, that this is. So we have, and it's time. This lady came for me from a bleeding. A bleeding here. He didn't care about the cosmetic part. Bleeding, bleeding, uh, that's, that's another thing. Bleeding reticular veins. It's a problem. How do you stop it? Don't tell me in stitch. <laughs> yeah, pressure. Yeah, tell me. What do you want to say? Elevate leg and pressure. But you go to the ear, they are not putting a stitch. That's it. But the best way to manage this after the acute episode is control, is pressure, is sclerotherapy. Okay? So you tell the patient, you see these black dots here? Those are the most at risk of bleeding, and you need to be, see the patients ahead of time, not to treat them if they don't want, but to explain to them that 99% happens in the shower because the maceration of the skin and the hot temperature. And that is going to look like a, mur like a murder scene. And they're going to panic, you know. They want any excuse to be famous and call 911. You need to tell them, teach them. You need to, you need to cool off. Look at the bleeding. It's going to be a little dot. And then the first thing they do when they find it, they put a towel. Don't put a towel. You don't know what you're pressing. When, we, when I used to do angiograms and all that stuff, I pressed with my fingers. I didn't put anything because I knew where, what, what I was pressing. Okay? So put one finger, I tell them, one is going to be a very tiny hole bleeding. Put your finger there. Get out of the shower. Put your leg up. Call your husband, your whatever, and get dressed first. And then, you know, have him hold it. The, the, uh, 20 minutes, it will stop. If it doesn't stop, then call me. You know, that changes when they are anticoagulation. But we'll talk about that later. But it's a patient's game. It's, it's, it's pa this is this is having patience to do this. Six months later, okay. See the staining here. This is what I was telling you. This brownish discoloration there. This patient came a year later for other reason, and I said, let me take a picture of your leg. 
this a year later. So time is a key on this. Don't tell the patients, oh, it's right now May, you are ready for July. No way in hell, it's too late. The patients that come to my office now for July, the one sclerotherapy because they are going to Bahamas, too late, too late. The best time to inject is between November and March. It's cool, they can wear the compressions, blah, blah, blah. This is another one. This, I needed to take these veins with phlebectomy. This was a mixed treatment and injections. See, when she comes and I see this, I said, damn it. Man, it's, it's not looking good. But then you take the picture and say, holy cow, it's much better. But if you just see this as a surgeon, you say, still not looking good, right? Well, it's not true. That's why the pictures are important, guys. Matting. This is a complication, and you need to know well. See this blushing area here? It's an inflammatory reaction. Remember, these are chemical irritants that you're going to put there. And how do the body respond the first steps of healing after, in, after injury? Angiogenesis. It's the same thing. So all this blushing is not a bruise. There are microscopic, you know, veins developing because most likely there is a vein underneath that you didn't see. So when you see matting, number one, stop. Number two, scan your patient and see if you see, if there is not a visible vein, you need to find if the vein where it's underneath and then inject that vein on their ultrasound. Don't touch this. Inject that vein on their ultrasound with the proper concentration, or if it's too big, do a darn phlebectomy. Wait four to six weeks, and then inject this part. It will get better. But don't lose your cool, because this is when the rubber meets the road, okay? Don't lose your cool and just explain what it is and what are we gonna do. And staining. This is what Dr. Peden is afraid of. This is a large vein that was injected and it wasn't drained. By draining, uh, Dr. Carroll, yeah, by draining what I mean is you inject the, 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 the sclerosin, you put um, cotton balls and paper tape, they put the compression stockings, they spend all day with the compressions and all night, take everything off in the morning, and then wear it for one week during the day, not three weeks, one week, the vein is already dead. But if you drain, the larger the vein, if you drain that clot too soon, it might, it might heal. And there is the vein again. So I leave it three weeks there. They come back three weeks later, and then with a 20-gauge needle, I just stab it, and like is it, get the blood out. So it's annoying because it doesn't take one, one, one stick, several. So it's almost like a tattoo, right? And then you drain it, and the hemosiderin doesn't stay there permanently, and the staining is much better much better and that's what is tedious that's what nobody wants to do that's like hell no i'm not going to drink because it's tedious it's is is an, annoying but again what did i tell you at the beginning of my talk you are not going to have everything so you choose you want to go home at five you need to drain this patient right but nobody's going to call you later so anyway so tell them the truth they are going to bruise don't be afraid of telling the truth because they ah chill out lady it's the bruise, you know, I told you you're going to bruise. <clears throat> Look at this stain. That's my patient. I did the phlebectomy, but she had so much, so many veins, I left a ton behind. They thrombose, and guess what? That's the stain. That's the stain. Of course, when I see the previous one, this is much better than when she came. It wasn't just a little single tiny vein. It was a cluster and cluster of veins. So, so far, so far, thank goodness she's happy. I always order my concentrations of sodium tetrahydrocyl sulfate 0.2%, so I don't have to think. And, and I told you I'm dyslexic, I don't care. And I order and 10 years, I check every time. Year and a half ago, I didn't check the concentration. This is my patient. I inject 2%. Okay? I told you I wasn't going to show you perfect stuff. Everybody can show all the stuff, but bringing the crap, that takes gonads. So there you go. That's my patient, okay? For the grace of God, because I believe in God, I don't care. I believe in God. And because I told them straight with crap face, but I told her straight, this is what happened. It's my fault. 
I hate that this happened to you, but I'll make it up to you, and, you know, anyway. She didn't sue me. I was very lucky. So this is what happens with ulceration. So you need to look at the concentration every time for the love of Christ. Learn, great surgeons learn from others' mistakes. Look at the concentration. Don't trust your nurse. Don't trust anybody. Because the only name in the, in, the, in the lawsuit is yours, nobody else. And guess what? The compound pharmacy that I ordered for years, they just plain hypoxia, cerebral hypoxia, and didn't say anything. They didn't have any records that I, I'm telling you, when the rubber meets the road, you are going to be alone. So cover your ass as much as possible. And enjoy, because you don't want to get, you don't want to end up like that, you know, in, 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 so when I was a fellow here, I met a lot of good people. Dr. Espada used, used to be one of the attendings here. He was pillar, I think, for me to get in here into, into Baylor was, was Baylor. Yeah, I know. He's, look what fellowship does to you. Look at this. I have a double light lead now. It's incredible. But anyway, so I had fun with these guys. Uh, George Noon, one of the right-handed, uh, the right hand of DeBakey, absolutely phenomenal surgeon, now retired you. <laughs> <clears throat> you probably don't, don't know him, but Megan, he, she was the, uh, the head of the vascular lab. She taught me a lot of vascular lab. I, we used to do six months rotation back then, and we used to take call in the vascular lab. So I was here on Saturdays doing ultrasounds. It's how you get proficient to it. It's how you get confident how to do stuff. She's dead, colon cancer. Jimmy Howell, one of the best surgeons I've ever known. He was one of the pillars in the creation of the coronary artery bypass in 1957 with DeBakey, dead now, but he was a phenomenal guy. Good old-fashioned Texan that gave me hell because I was, from <laughs> I was from Mexico, but I didn't say anything, and we ended up being excellent friends and, uh, until his death. And of course, my mentor, never get close, <laughs> never get close to a, guys with, a guy with a kilt, okay?